Hello everyone, welcome to part one of our Impact Investors Showcase. We're just going to give a few minutes for those who are still logging on, all right? We'll start in a bit. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Thank you so much for being part of our 8th Impact Partners Investor Showcase. For those of you joining us for the first time, this webinar is brought to you by IX Impact Partners, the world's largest SME private placement platform for impact investing. I see that we have a diverse group of investors on the call. Welcome, everyone. Let's get started with today's event. Today, we're featuring three women-focused enterprises that are working towards advancing financial inclusivity and climate resilience in their respective regions, including an enterprise supported by Koika. My name is Priya. I'm the Senior Vice President of Marketing at IIX, and I'll be your MC for today. We're super excited to share more about these businesses with you. But before we get started, let me share a few useful technical tips. All attendees today will be kept on mute throughout the webinar, but we invite you to share your comments via the chat button on the bottom left as you listen in. Do follow the additional info posted from our team in the chat throughout the webinar. You may post questions at any time during the session by clicking on the Q&A icon on the bottom right panel of your screen. Remember to include the name of any specific speaker whom the question is directed to. We will address questions in the Q&A segment at the end of our session. There will be live polls along the way for you to participate in, so please keep an eye out, out for those as they appear on your screen. If you run into any technical issues, my colleague Reshman is on standby to help. Please drop him a message in the chat addressing it to hosts and panelists. Now on to today's agenda. The Impact Partners team will kick off the session with an introduction to IX and Impact Partners. This will be followed by a fireside chat on the topic of harnessing the collective power of female leadership to drive inclusivity and sustainability with our guest speaker. After that, we'll be jumping right into the exciting lineup of enterprises who will be taking us through how they're making real change in their industries and moving us closer to the global sustainable goals. Last but not least, we'll open the floor for a Q&A session with the enterprises. So do stay till the end of the program for that lively discussion. Before we dive in, let me briefly introduce the speakers taking us through today's session. Representing Impact Partners, we have Ms. Shania Kasuma and Mr. Jonathan Ababikrama, Director of the Impact Partners. We are also honoured to have Ms. Mikey Doya as our special guest, the founder and managing partners of Epic Angels. You'll learn more about each of them later. Kicking things off, we have Ms. Shania Kasuma from Impact Partners. In her day-to-day, -day, Shania manages the Impact Partners platform and business development while assisting enterprises with technical assistance and capital raise. Shania, over to you. Thank you, Priya. Good day, everyone. It's a huge privilege to start our eighth webinar showcase, and it is so heartening to see many of us attending from different parts of the world. To kick things off, I will start by sharing a short background about IAX before other exciting lineup of events coming up later. IAX was founded by our CEO, Professor Doreen Shanas, in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. We are formed with a mission to create a more resilient and inclusive financial market that works for everyone. As we celebrate our 14th anniversary this year, we continue our work with a renewed focus on climate action, women's empowerment, and fostering resilient communities. Over the years, we have really pushed the boundaries of the financial markets, which enabled us to create many of the world's first. The first social stock exchange, the first private placement platform for impact investing, and the first gender lens social bond listed on a stock exchange. The foundation of all our work is our proprietary impact management approach, which uses the framework of risk, return, and impact. 
we have been able to positively impact 159 million underserved lives and unlocked over $281 million in private sector capital. In IX, we have multiple products and services that work in tandem with one another to scale enterprises, magnify sustainability outcomes, and mobilize private sector capital from the market. IX takes a holistic approach to catalyze impact investing ecosystem. Firstly, we provide data-driven insights for enterprises and stakeholders. Subsequently, we provide catalytic capital through our IIX Growth Fund to propel early-stage enterprises into their growth stage. In conjunction with the IIX values, Impact Planners team provides curated technical assistance, impact measurement, and capital raise support for growth-stage enterprises to tap into the private sector capital and then graduate to become a market leader. Mature enterprises are then able to deepen their reach and impact by getting capital access from our Women's Livelihood Fund. Echoing IX's mission of impacting the environment, women, and underserved people, the Impact Partners platform was relaunched last year with the main aim of increasing access to capital markets by connecting enterprises with investors such as yourself across the globe. Over the last one year, we have been working extensively on building the platform and this has culminated in the platform having more than 550 active deals right now. These enterprises are at the forefront of sustainable development, working across 15 different sectors at different stages, ranging from startups all the way to mature enterprises. This gives investors with different investment mandate a unique opportunity to build their portfolio in impact investing. We are very proud to have closed 10 deals with different investors through the platform, and we are thrilled to see the growing interest in sustainability space. Overall, we have unlocked $151 million on the platform, impacted over 140 million lives, and avoided 1.4 million tons of carbon. If you'd like to learn more about how Impact Partners can partner with you for pipeline development, please feel free to connect with us via our contact details available on the chat. Thank you. Back to you, Priya. Thanks, Shania, for the introduction. Let's dive straight into the fireside chat with today's topic, harnessing the collective power of female leadership to drive inclusivity and sustainability. Our special guest for the fireside chat is Ms. Mikey Doyer, the founder and managing partner of Epic Angels. They are a powerhouse network of angel investors revolutionizing angel investing. They are well on track to becoming the largest female-only angel investor network in Asia-Pacific. I will also invite Mr. Jonathan Abubikarama, Director of Impact Partners, to lead this session. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Priya. Good evening and good morning to all our investors joining from around the world today. Uh, and a warm welcome to Ms. Doyer. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here today to share your insights. Welcome. Thanks. Happy to be here. Great topic. Great. Uh, so let's start with, with an overview of Epic Angels. So I'll shoot across a few questions to understand so that audience knows who Epic Angels are, what your investment thesis is, so that they get a flavor of uh, who you are. So uh, Epic Angels has been making a lot of traction more lately. Uh, so kudos to you for that and your team, especially bringing women to the center of the conversation. Uh, we would like to hear how Epic Angels came about and your humble but tremendous growth story. Yeah, how how did this all get started? I sometimes wonder as well now. Now, I think before moving to Singapore, that's where I live today, I lived in San Francisco. And when you live in San Francisco, angel investing is just as easy as getting a coffee. It's very mainstream. Everyone has access. My first angel investment was $100. So pretty doable, right, for everyone. Um, I was running a company in San Francisco. I did an exit about two and a half years ago, and then I moved to Singapore. I had more time, and I wanted to continue my angel investment journey here. But I ran into the issue that in Asia, I saw many people expect that you put at least $50,000 in one startup. And I was like, wow, that's a lot of money. Um, it doesn't matter how much money you have, but that early stage, that's a lot of risk. And that went against the philosophy that I was used to in Silicon Valley. 
Um, so um, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to do it myself. So together with a few friends, uh, we started to do our first investments and they were female friends of mine. Because I think that taps into the other element as well that I noticed is because I'm a number person. I studied math. Uh, I've worked at Price, Price Wardhouse Coopers and M&A. So I just love numbers. But I saw that many of my female friends, even though they were in executive positions, they just put the money in the bank. And I was like, hmm, right, that needs to change. Um, so that combined uh, led to Epic Angels. Wow, that's a tremendous story. I love how the way uh, y'all are making investment also accessible to everybody, even a, a angel investing. Because the angel investing, typically you would think that it's only for high net worth uh, people who have a lot of money, but I think you have made it accessible. So, and also bringing that capital to enterprises in Asia who don't have access to capital as well. So, tremendous work. Uh, so, I'll deep dive into more uh, deeper questions. So Epic Angels has a varied portfolio of companies which you all invest in. Could you please tell me uh, how you structure your portfolio and what are your key investment criteria, what you look for in an investment? Yeah, so we focus on startups in Asia Pacific, which is very broad. It's between Pakistan and Japan, China and New Zealand, everything in between, large region. Um, so that's that's number one. Why is that? Well, we are here. Epic Angels is currently only in Asia, uh, focused on Asia. So that's where we want to make an impact. Initially, when we started, we said... It doesn't matter who the founder is, if it's a man or a woman, uh, because we're focused on getting female investors. So let's not focus on the founders. However, what we very quickly saw when it was an all male team, it just didn't work in front of our team of female investors. The dynamics were just off. My assumption is this is exactly what's happening when a female team is pitching towards an all male investor team. Uh, and that's that's why I'm so passionate about this topic as well at Epic Angels. I really want to get more female investors. Right now, only 2.4% of decision makers in venture capital is a woman. And that really has got to change uh, because we speak a lot about why female founders are not getting the capital that they should get uh, based upon the results. Uh, but I feel that the real reason for that is there's not enough decision makers in, uh, who allocate the, the capital. And so that's what I'm set out to change. So when I saw that happening, that these all male teams just didn't work, I changed it. And I said, you know what, it should be, it should have at least female leadership. It's okay if it's a male founder, but there should be at least a woman on the board, on the executive team that has decision-making power. And, and that worked much better. That's uh, great. Because if you see in Asia, like the women representation in startups is also quite low. As you correctly mentioned, the startup capital going into women-led startups is also one of the re reasons why, uh, I mean, it's all male denominated investor groups sometimes, and it doesn't ma match eye to eye as well. So I love the combo that you're bringing female investors who do understand the issues women face as well. So uh, my question on the market sentiments or even how much do you consider impact? Of course, women alignment, you mentioned, uh, is a key component. But do you normally com consider impact uh, first or do you, how much do you weigh uh, for impact measurement when you make an investment? It's not one of our initial criteria, uh, impact. However, what I do see also there, the, the startups that are not just for profit, but profit with a purpose, do resonate so much better uh, with our angels. Uh, I mean, I know that our largest investments till date, uh, which which was in Sahat Kahani, and we got actually connected through you guys, that's Ray Impact Partners. So that's why we're so happy to work together with you. Um, that one was the, the largest investment that we raised for a startup till date. And that's because it's a super good business. It's very solid, right? Really smart business models that these women um, actually implemented. But it's not only that, it also has a massive impact on um, the, the female population that can actually work as a doctor through their systems, but also on reaching uh, the, the larger community in areas where normally they wouldn't have access to healthcare. So it was really that combined business and impact those just resonate the best, even though it's not formally a criteria, I, because it's interesting. A lot of times I hear people like, oh, you're female investors. 
oh, so then then you're just doing female founders and and so more charity cases, right? That is unfortunately a big perception that I see in the market. So I want to avoid that that's what's happening. I mean, the primary reason for all our investors is to get a financial return. That is absolute number one. But that doesn't exclude making an impact as well while we're doing that investment. So you do see that that definitely resonates best. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so I know that uh, you guys are more bolder than some of the investors, are, at least we speak, because if you look at Pakistan, uh, most investors tend not to go there, but you guys have gone. So kudos to you for that again, uh, in going into places which other investors don't try to go. And of course, they have definitely Sehat Khan, we've been working with them and tremendous story. So great. Uh, so uh, since we have a very uh, diverse uh, investor group today, investing in all parts of Asia, maybe key lessons you've learned, like you mentioned, you invest in Japan, all the way to Pakistan, South Asia. So maybe have you come across any differences in terms of the enterprises, any all the, all the same, or do they have any different perceptions, but maybe two key differences in different markets in Asia, which you've come across? Maybe let me start with the similarities. Um, uh, because we're investing very early stage. Seed is our sweet spot, uh, but anything between pre-seed, seed, series A, uh, that's where we typically invest. So it's pretty early in the journey. When you're that early in the journey, in my opinion, the most important element is the team. You're investing in the team, you're investing in the founder. And whether that investment was done in Pakistan or in Japan, we strongly believe in the founder that's behind it. Uh, we really feel this founder is going to make it happen. No matter what that local market is going to be about, um, they're going to make it happen. Because, I mean, I lived in Europe. I lived in the United States, currently living here in Asia. And a startup is all about, you know, having a vision, having a big vision, having this big goal that you want to achieve. And knowing how to realize it, knowing how to get it done uh, in your local market and really get that traction, listen to your customers and never fall in love with your product, fall in love with the problem that you're solving. Uh, so fall in love with what your customers really need. And that's across all the regions, no matter where. And I feel this early stage, that's predominantly what we're looking at. And of course, you're looking into you know, hey, how's that landscape? But luckily in Asia, most of the countries are growing, right? The GDP forecast for all these countries are looking very positive. So there's tons and tons of opportunities. So I think that that's the similarity. If you look very specific market to market, um, how we, because I mean, I can't have all the knowledge. Uh, I live, in, I, I've even never been to Pakistan. I was I was on the phone today with, uh, with another investment that we've done in Pakistan with Oran. And um, uh, when we were speaking with them um, as well, I was like, I really need to come, right? But I don't have the knowledge, but how you work together is making sure you work together with partners like you guys, right? But we also have other partners that we're working together with, accelerator programs. Um, our angels are in all the different geographies. So, I mean, Japan as well, we have a couple of angels that are in Japan, we make sure we have a good conversation with them because they're local and they can share that knowledge with the rest of the angel base. Like how would this resonate in the local context? And so that really helps. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. I noted that your angel group has very diverse set of angels, as you mentioned. So, I mean, a lot of investors do not have. So I think a lot of investors also come back to IX asking for on-ground support. I mean, which you guys have through your angel network in different geographies because of your ticket size is not big guess some of the other groups which they expect so uh my next question is of course you know the globe is going into recession but i've seen that you guys have been making your investments uh quite easily and of course you've been not stopping so great work but how do you see this uh funding dearth affecting the market do you see that um any it will it will shorten or uh, what's your strategy i i or do you believe in more on the macro side of views or do you mostly believe in companies I think you answered the question already before that you mostly mentioned, look at the company's aspect, but how, how do you look at the market at the moment? 
I mean, the market is pretty scary, of course, right now. It's super, super volatile. Interest rates are good. So, you know, if you want to be safe, you just can put, park your money on a bank account and just collect some interest. And because public markets are, are quite a nightmare right now as well. So you don't want to put your money there. Or maybe you do, right, with a long-term perspective. But these are a lot of the conversations, of course, that are going on. I mean, last week with the whole SVB collapse, uh, we had a we have a WhatsApp community with our angels, super active com uh, conversation that we're having and thinking indeed about what's that bigger impact. I think also a lot of our angels work in tech and we see a lot of the layoffs happening right now. So, yes, right. We do see that impact with a couple of angels. Good part is on our ends, our ticket sizes are low. So that helps because then if you only need to you can invest with two and a half thousand dollars. That's doable for a lot of people, even if it's scary. It's not that super, super big amount. The other part is uh, we're investing very early stage. So we know that these companies need to get through the first to the next couple of years. Um, and after that, well, we're all hoping and forecasting that that will go up again, right? Because that it is we're in a downturn right now. We all realize that and we know that. So I think it has the largest impact on, on the series C, D and up on the very early stage look at history, this is usually where the best companies are being born in, in this type of, of economy. So we actually see a lot of opportunity from there. I think the other thing that we're seeing in terms of uh, perspective, where maybe a year ago, two years ago, everyone was really focused on getting tech investments. You see that right now people are like, hmm, maybe I'll focus a little less on tech. Uh, maybe I want to have something else as well. I mean, I think later on we're going to see Husk, uh, who has an actual physical product. Uh, and you see that that is getting much more traction right now, where people are, okay, can I touch it? Uh, is it real? Because we see what's happening in the tech industry. Let's focus again on some more product related startups as well. So that is a shift that I'm seeing. Yep, great insight. So, as you, uh, I mean, that's a very good point. I think tech is i wouldn't say it's on decline but people are now looking at more touch and feel old school which offers solid returns so we are almost up in our time uh, time is coming up so i would like to uh, throw a quick fireside chat of uh, quick fire, fire questions uh to you so the top uh firstly uh top three qualities you look for in a startup um so that's the founder right uh and that founder needs to be super focused on the customer and really understanding that customer experience and how to how to connect with that that for me is uh, basically the number one thing okay great and of course uh this is the month of women so of course uh three maybe two tips for female focused startups so today we are going to have on all female uh presenters presenting startups presenting today so maybe three tips for or two to three tips to female founders who's making a difference all around the world today. I mean, it's about confidence. Um, and I, I've never felt that as a woman, I've never felt that I'm different than a man. And sometimes when we are having these conversations about, you know, you're a woman, how do you do that? And I was like, why would I do that different? I, I don't feel any different than a man. So, and I think that, it might be my culture, it might be my background, the way I grew up, but I'm like, there is no difference, right? So when you go out there, you are you and you're the best in the world, right? You're, you, you are the best. And at the same time, you're not better than anyone else, of course, eh, because it's not about being arrogant, uh, but you are the best that, that there's out there. So go for that and, and really believe in yourself. Um, so that's number one. The other part is build a network. Um, reach out to people, uh, say what you need, um, have an ask. And that's something that I tell our founders as well. And when we get the updates about how the company is doing, I always say like, yeah, cool about the update, but what I really want to hear from you, what do you need from me? How can I help you as an investor in getting into the next step? So say out loud what you need, because there are so many people around you that will help you. Great. I mean, it's definitely a partnership when you're an investor. So I think partnership between the enterprise and the investor is very key. So Ms. Dyer, thank you for your time today. I personally gained a lot of insights and I'm sure the audience did too. Uh, we look forward to being connected with you again and bringing more deals across to you and doing more deals in the region as well. 
and of course, kudos to you uh, for bringing women to the center of the conversation and also the decision making table. Thank you for your time today. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Yeah. Thanks so much for the insightful discussion, Ms. Doya and Mr. Abhigrama. Now for our main event, I'm ready to hear from the three women-focused enterprises making real change in their industries while helping to advance the SDG goals. We have a diverse group today coming to us from Rwanda, Vietnam, and Cambodia. IX takes on a journey with each enterprise that we choose to work with. All three enterprises presenting today have been engaged with us over the last three months. We are geared to support them through their upcoming milestones. We will first hear from Munyak's Echo, a woman-owned, women-led company based in Rwanda that provides access to clean and affordable energy solutions in Rwandan households, businesses, and farms. I will now pass the time to CEO and founder of Munyak's Echo, Ms. Francine Munyaneza. Over to you. Thank you, Ria. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, in brief, I was born and raised partially in Europe, and I was back at seven years old in Rwanda. After three years, we ran away as refugee in DRC, neighboring country, and we did not have access to electricity. Then uh, 30 years later, when I was working, globetrotting around the world, uh, working for the International Committee of the Red Cross, I saw the exact same situation of lack of access to energy. And in addition, uh, climate change impacted more and more our people. Hence, I took the decision to leave my job and with my saving, uh, started the adventure of clean energy in uh, clean energy in business and uh, creating a woman pioneering, pioneering company in solar industry in Rwanda and for neighboring countries also. Yes, indeed, 48% uh, of African people have access uh, to electricity. 40% of the post harvest lost and 50% of medicines are exposed to due to lack of refrigeration. Moreover, in Rwanda, in Africa, people face high cost of fossil fuel, charcoal, fuel lamp, fuel lamp, wood, etc. While at the same time polluting the atmosphere, destroying forests, destroying the biodiversity and impacting negatively the climate. To face this challenge, uh, Munyak Seco sales and installs, next slide please, uh, solar uh, water heaters. Uh, we install in, in resident and urban areas as well as in rural areas like this fish farm, fish farming that you see in the picture. We install solar photovoltaic system and in health facilities, schools, and also in these places you see in the picture, Nyabikere, it's a village in the in a town in Burundi. Uh, we install solar water pumping and solar cold room in urban and peri-urban and rural areas. Uh, these installations re rely on a business model. Next slide. Uh, a business model which includes flexible payment. You can see that 20% of, of our payment are made in, in leasing or by installment and other cash by uh, uh, direct uh, cash and sales. We make the difference by offering quality services, not only for individual customers, but also for businesses, health facilities, international organizations, public institutions, NGOs. And we have also uh, two offices now in Rwanda and some operation in Burundi. And we are willing to extend, we are extending in the two neighboring country where more than 85% of the population don't have access to energy. We do that through partnership. Next slide. And when we talk about partnership, it's not only this geographic, geographic extension, next slide please, but also uh, for innovations. Uh, partnership, we do partnership, for example, with Solaris Kit. Uh, they are from Scotland, and uh, we do partnership to see how we can allow low income population to get access to hot water, solar hot water, of course, and also for manufacturing projects. We do also partnership uh, for capacity building. For example, we have uh, Enersol, uh, he's a Belgian company. We have also, again, Solaris Kit. We do also um, training and capacity building with them. And also we do, we are negotiating now with Jinko from China to see Jinko Solar to see how they can help us in capacity building. We do also um, 
partnership for advisory, BDO, uh, we have a program with them, Manufacturing Africa. We do also with um, uh, fi Finance Catalyst Get Invest. We do also with um, a, a, an NGO, woman NGO, COCOF. And this is for remote rural areas. We do partnership also with National Electricity Company, as they have a program for rural electrification to give grant to end user customers. Similar partnership are in process in Burundi, where there is a new electrification program, which is called Soleil Nyadikeriza. Nyadikeriza is to say, sun, please enlighten us. Yeah. Consequently, next slide, for the last three years, we had the revenue growth of 10%. And uh, cumulative revenues, next slide, please, of uh, 2.5 million, despite the COVID crisis and uh, despite the long lockdown and movement restriction we had in the country. We reached also 130,000 beneficiaries, and the new financing will allow the company to better respond to the needs of the market. We see uh, that our activities can go from more than 2.6 million to uh, two times, three times more in the next. Uh, years. Next slide. And we do that and we work in the male dominated sectors uh, where uh, we are the only company, next slide please, the only company who really have a woman's specificity. Uh, we really have, we empower women. We have 60% of our staff. Now it's 60, we wrote 50, but now it's 60% of our staff who are women. 60% of total trained uh, youth, we do internship and apprenticeship, are women. 70% of people who benefited from, benefited from uh, our solar home systems installation are women. We also reduce carbon emissions, 5,000 tons, tons annually. We are also re recycling our waste metallic and we do furniture, we do building materials, and also we have agreement for to recycle our batteries. Uh, with the, 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 the fact that we are impact 130,000 beneficiaries, this really makes the life change for, for them. It's improved education for children, improved knowledge, education for children, for example, children can um, re, uh, do the homework during the night. Uh, we also, we make that business are created in generative activities. People have access to internet, access to info, access, access to the world, in fact. And this is a huge difference for them. And also we are creating job, 30 direct job, and also one of the 10 indirect jobs. And we can do that thanks to our management on the next slide, slides. Uh, the management, we have a great team, great team uh, a mix of generation with difference and complementary background and really open mindset. Thanks to this, this specific team, we managed to be selected as the 10 finalists of the African Business Heroes uh, finalist competition done by Jack Ma. It is worth 20,000 competitors. We managed to be the 10th out of the 10 panelists. And also we were selected for the Stanford uh, SEED program, which is a, a very nice challenge, SEED transformation program. And we are currently doing that. And we can do more. On the next slide, you will see that uh, we, can, we, we are looking for 2.8 million uh, dollars. Uh, we can do more. We can answer to the, to the, to the the need. We need important stock. In Rwanda, you know, the country is landlocked. So uh, the supply chain is a very big issue. So the stock has a very important uh, cost for us. And also the capex, uh, like leasing of mobile solar code room, uh, leather lift, pickups, all these kind of furnitures and, and equipment that we need. And we can do that because we have high perspective on the market. On the next slide, please. Uh, you can see that Rwanda has the ambition to be a middle income country by 2025. And these ambitions include definitely climate change adaptation and mitigations. And clean energy is really part of it. And we notice uh, in the neighboring countries that the needs are much more important. 80, more than 85% of the population don't have access to uh, energy. On the other hand, there is a program that government and international institutions are setting up to incentivize the private sector. So really there is, there is something important for us. So that is why I'm inviting you to join the fight to, with us to adopt and sponsors others, and others might be also Munyakseko, in order to access clean energy solutions. 
let's together uh, save money, save energy, and save the planet. Thank you very much. And over to you, Ria. Thank you so much, Ms. Mignanenza, for that presentation. We'll come back to you during the Q&A. Just a reminder, if anyone in the audience has any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat box. Ms. Munyaneza will try to answer in the chat or we'll come back to those questions after the next two presentations. Now we will proceed to the second enterprise, MA Food. They are a female-led startup based in Vietnam that applies 4D printing technology combined with protein from mycelium to create a plant-based substitute for meat. Ms. Pham Hong Van, CEO and founder of MA, will take you through her company's presentation. Over to you, Ms. Van. Thank you, Irina. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is Van Phan, the founder and CEO of the MA startup in Vietnam that focuses on the alternative protein based on our mushroom biotechnology. So MA is based on our family business since 2009. And I decided to turn my family business into the startup company in 2017 when seeing the big opportunity in the plant-based protein industry. After got three angel investment rounds, we are now at the acceleration phase to expand to global. So when comparing the market size of the meat industry with 1.4 trillion US dollars to the plant-based meat, which is only 2%, there is a huge room for any companies to grow in this industry. The goal rates are really to 20% annually, and we reach to nearly 27 billion US dollars in the next seven years. So based on our advantage in the fungi based on biotechnology and food tech for more than 20 years, we enter this market. So we want to show the four big problems with this business, First, the serious disease from the animal mess, and the lack of healthy, nutritious meat alternative. And the third is the need of diversified meat eat underserved. And the final, the ethical is the sustainable concerns of animal meat eater. So our product lines are divided into the two big main groups. The first one is the creative mushroom-based product with a diversified category food bring snacks, confectionery, and ecstasies. The second is that alternative meat with launching officially this year. So after raising this fund successfully, we want to build our pilot plant with three tons per month. And in 2025, we upscale 24 tons per month. And at this scale, we can have a lower price from at least 30% to other competitors at the Beyond Meat or Impossible Food in the USA, and 10% to 20% to the Omni in the Thailand or the Southeast Asia market. So parallel with this, we will still, uh, keep moving forward in the creating mushroom-based product with more diversified in the different kind of category product, as brings snacks, confectionery, include of our fresh exclusive mushroom. So who we are that we can make the plans come true. I am with more than 10 years experience in the fungus business, exist to other startups in importing and exporting seafood industry and the organic agriculture from farm to fork model before working full time for ME. And Mr. Duan Bo is our CTO and CFO he was MIT and Calab University alumni in the big data, software development, and master of the business management. He just exited his first startup in telecom industry in the USA with more than 100, 100 million US dollars. And Ms. Quyen Chen, Dr. Kang Nguyen, is our chair and deputy R&D officer. They are owner many patents with serial research with the Vietnamese government and international organization as UNIDO, FAO, and UNICEF. Their, their patent is now, uh, is now working on the practical fact uh, successfully. And our traction to date with more than more 400 retail point sales via the biggest supermarket chains in Vietnam, AI, Young, E-Mart, Co-Mart, Bixi, I can see like that. And our total revenue to date is 1.5 million US dollar, equal to 2 million units sold out to the market already. So our revenue stream comes from three main streams. 
The first one is mainly that 80% revenue of ours is from selling directly our brand packaged product via the B2B and B2C sales system channel, via the supermarket chain, food store chain, e-commerce platform like Lazada, Sophie, as we are selling right now. And the second from selling our future exclusive fresh mushroom in 2026, um, 2025. And the third is that from OEM and ODM of our process ingredients for other food and various production companies as we are doing with our customer in the UK, India, and more. So we own our R&D brand name, sales system, and core factory, other supply chains we will cooperate with our partner for more than 13 years with the supply chain of the creative mushroom-based product. And we take the control and management of the whole supply chains from R&D to our end consumer with the alternative meat product group. So our go-to-market strategy will enable us to grow and achieve our goal in 2026. Partnership with the top biggest distributor in that market, such as a cross and closure distributor in the Europe, Mac and Panzer in the UK, and selling via the international and local e-commerce, such as the Huopang in Korea, Q10 in Singapore, Lazada Sophie in the Soviet Asia, Alibaba and Amazon in globally. And the special thing here is that we will launch our flagship store as the funnel of marketing and sales in that new market. And we will take the control and active marketing funnel to touch to the feedback directly with our partner, with our distributor and end consumer. So as follow our business plan in this next four, four years, we will hit to at least 16 million US dollar with profitable in the 2025. The revenue will consist 70% of all alternative meat and will grow starting in this year. So we raising at least 2 million US dollar with a tight investment in equity, convertible note or safe note with a share offer 20% for 16 month runaway. We will use these funds for 40% for R&D and more than 20% for plant, more than 10% for operation talent teams and 25% for sales and marketing. Thank you for your time listening to me and we welcome you when you want to join to build a global business with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Van, for that presentation. I would like to remind the audience to start sharing your questions in the Q&A box, and we will address them after the final speaker. Now, to close off the enterprise segment, we have Husk, a female-led enterprise based in Cambodia. They convert rice husks into organic biochar to build resilience for smallholder farmers. I will now pass the time to CEO and co-founder of Husk, Ms. Eloise Bucklin. Over to you, Eloise. Hi, thank you so much and welcome to everyone. I am Eloise Buckland, CEO and co-founder of Husk, and we are the leading producer of carbon-based fertilizers in emerging markets. So what our product does is it regenerates soils. Um, one third of the entire planet right now is degraded in terms of soils. We also sequester carbon, and I'm sure I don't need to um, tell you about the importance of climate change. And our products also increase the revenues of smallholder farmers by improving their yields and giving them a return on investment. So next slide, please. So the reason um, I set out to, to found co-found with another woman, Husk, is I've been from a very young age, very conscious of the impacts of climate change, given that I grew up in a tropical environment uh, with hurricanes and no water, electricity, um, and telephone for, for months on end. And I realized from a very young age that we so depend on nature for absolutely everything. Uh, so I've spent the last 20 years working on climate change and social innovation and focusing on education for sustainability, which I think is, is key. However, uh, after 20 years career in education for sustainability, my passion was to just go a little bit faster on making a difference to this um, extremely challenging problem of climate change. So I set up a project with a Carol Reuse five years ago 
to have a tangible impact on what we feel are the people who are most affected by climate change, and that's smallholder farmers. Um, the reason smallholder farmers are most affected, obviously, is because they have increasing droughts, increasing water management problems, increasing soil degradation, and, and consistently low yields. So our products really focus on smallholder farmers, and also they produce 60% of the world's food. So we really need uh, farmers to be able to continue to grow food. Next slide, please. And the solution we have is we convert rice husk, which is a low value agricultural byproduct into biochar, which basically acts like a sponge in the soil. So for those of you not familiar, the sponge like quality, it's high porosity means that the biochar will absorb nutrients. So farmers use less fertilizers. It will absorb water so farmers can can go through long dry periods um, much more uh, much more easily and it also hosts microorganisms has been described as a hotel for microorganisms the more microorganisms in the soil the more life in the soil the higher yields the healthier crops the healthier revenue so so that's what biochar does and next slide please and it's a very age old practice that we have put in innovation, technology and finance to scale up and to make available to, to smallholder farmers across the world. This is our first operation in Cambodia, where we've been working for the last four years. Um, and next slide, please. We don't only make biochar, we convert the biochar into organic carbon based fertilizers, which we sell in the fertilizer market, um, which is a 20 billion dollar market globally um, and a huge, huge expanding market in terms of organic as well. So our products, we have a suite of products that um, are useful for farmers from seedling stage to mature trees stage from different types of crops. And over the last three years, we've developed around 250 farm trials with an average yield increase of 25%, which is great. So farmers are growing more food, they're grow growing healthier crops. However, we're also noticing a 25% reduction in costs because of this porosity, the sponge-like quality of the biochar, uh, farmers are using less chemical products. So this means a positive return on investment for farmers. Um, and that's really our mission is, is getting this positive return on investment for the farmers and for husk. Next slide, please. So we also sell uh, carbon removal credits. And we were one of the first companies outside Asia and the US to do this. We are um, they're in huge demand, the price is soaring, and this enables us to make our products more afford affordable and to ensure that we as Husk as a company get a high return on, on the investment that we've put in and for our shareholders. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, the smallholder farmers that we work in at the moment, we're just in Cambodia. We've been piloting this um, concept in Cambodia. We've proven the concept, proven the value, and worked with smallholder farmers across um, 12 different provinces. And we now are using this investment round to consolidate our operations, meet the market demand in Cambodia and start to build a model to replicate across Southeast Asia. There are 1.5 billion smallholder farmers in the world. So we see this huge opportunity. Yes, next slide, please. So we are B2B and aside from working with agricultural cooperatives and input distributors, we also have a network of women super farmers. So these women go door to door and we train them in the value of the biochar in the soil, the value of organic matter, and they sell stock for their local distributors. So this enhances our, our distribution and, and is a great way for the women to actually earn some extra cash. We pay them via mobile mobile money and 20% of our sales last year were thanks to the women super farmers. So we're increasingly using this uh, distribution mechanism as we scale. Next slide, please. So just a little bit more about the product and the size of the market globally, 20, uh, sorry, 10 billion organic fertilizers is a growing market and 4 billion um, biostimulants. And the biostimulant aspect is something increasingly of interest across the world is letting nature do her work. So effectively what the biochar does is what nature has always done, have a forest fire, put carbon in the soil, and this enhances uh, the soil's quality to enable crops to grow healthily. So the, the product covers a broad spectrum of different sub products within the agri inputs market and, and we they're all in growing demand. Next slide, please. 
some of our plans are across Southeast Asia. We're already exporting to Laos. We're working with the largest coffee producer in Vietnam, Ecom, so the last coffee trader. And we're doing some trials with uh, Taiwa, one of the largest tapioca um, producers in Thailand. So our expansion plan is to build um, the model in Cambodia and then replicate across Southeast Asia. And next slide, please. With the support of multiple organizations locally and internationally, then take this to an international scale where we hope to get 1 million tons of carbon back in the soil by 2035, which means having at least three production sites um, over different three different regions, Southeast Asia, the Mediterranean and Latin America. Next slide. And we are seeking at this at this point support uh, to close our rounds to build up our team. We already have a solid team in Cambodia, and as we go forward, we're building up a C suite to develop and support an international team to work across the three regions. Next slide, please. And in terms of our round, uh, we have been raising one million in equity, and I have to say we literally have only a hundred thousand left, and already several interested parties. But I'm really uh, really happy to have an um, investor on board through IIX because you've been a fantastic support through our journey. So really looking forward to uh, to working with some of you in the future. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Ms. Buckland, and all the speakers for sharing your presentations. They were very enlightening. We're excited to be supporting you during your capital raise process and to help you scale your impact. I will now invite Mr. Abhikarama of the Impact Partners team back to moderate the session, Q&A session, sorry. Jonathan, please. Thank you again, Priya. Uh, hope all our listeners uh, enjoyed the stellar presentations today. Uh, we will now conduct a quick Q&A with all the enterprises. So uh, there's there's been a few questions in the Q&A section. So I'll try to post uh, most of the questions posted there. Uh, audience, feel free to post any of the other questions and the enterprises will also try to answer them. Uh, so I'll try to accommodate most of the questions as well. Uh, so my first question is uh, to Ms. Munyaneza of Munyex. Uh, so maybe uh, if you could just uh, explain uh, on one of the questions asked in the Q&A box, what's Munyex, uh, Munyex Echo's uh, revenue model? Uh, do customers pay as a pay-as-you-go model or is it like a more upfront fee or a bulk payment for the equipment? Yes. In fact, we have uh, different ways of uh, uh, for, for payment. Uh, we have some, some customers are paying by cash in advance. They pay by cash and we do the installations. Uh, some others, we, we have seen that the purchasing power has been a, a challenge <laughs> in, in Rwanda. So we put in place a system of payment by installment. Uh, for solar water heaters, it's not pay as a service, but payment by installment. So the, the customers can have the choice either to pay cash, either to pay in installment six months or one year. Besides that, uh, we have a possibility for solar home system as there is a, I mentioned the partnership with the, the Rwanda Energy Group, the National Electricity Company, where they give grants uh, to end user customers. So with them, we can and as we are uh, providing solar home system, so people pay just a small part of the solar home system. For solar cold room, we are putting in place, we did a first pilot, we are putting in place a system of leasing, is to say that uh, people are paying uh, when they occupy the, the cold room, they pay per credits and per day. And after a period, we are leasing to the cooperatives or to aggregators. And after a certain period, the the solar code room will be their property. Yeah. So the second question from the audience is, uh, what's uh, Muniax Echo's growth plan beyond uh, Rwanda? And of course, there's another question. Do you have uh, prospects to grow into Tanzania as well? So maybe a yes. little bit about your growth plans beyond uh, Rwanda. Yeah. In fact, the growth plans for the moment, we are targeting first Burundi and uh, DRC because we have seen that there is a, a, an imp there are important needs in these countries, as I mentioned earlier, uh, around 85 to, to 89 people percent of the population don't have access to electricity. And uh, the rate is, is much uh, lower lower in Tanzania. That's why we prioritize the two countries. And we are prioritizing them also because we know them very well. 
personally I grew up as I mentioned in Congo and also I know very well Burundi it's the same language this almost the same challenges that we are facing and uh, for Tanzania in the later stage because we target Africa in the later stage but we put some priorities first Rwanda Congo and then Africa and then we we can analyze and evaluate the needs of the market after that thank you ma'am uh, so the next next question is to Miss Enmi, uh, sorry, Miss Wan of Enmi. Uh, so uh, basically the first question is, what makes Enmi stand out in the plant-based meat industry? Sorry, you had to unmute yourself, Miss Wan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. So Enmi is standing advantage in the industry because our taste and flavor was verified through the trial sales in the Vietnamese and the region already. So very good feedback from the user and the professional chefs. And in, beside that, the price, we have a better price for, uh, to com when compared to other competitors, definitely uh, from 10 to 30%, uh, lower price than competitor like the Beyond Meat, Impossible Food in the USA our army in the Thailand and in Vietnam. We are now the first mover in this industry. Thank you, Ms. Um, So basically the second question is again uh, from the audience as well. Uh, what are the social impact goals which you uh, tend to attain from the additional investment of which you're asking of 2 million? And of, of course, what are the benefits you provide for your farmer networks as well? Yeah, thank you. So now MA has at least 80% female as a manager, staff, and as far as you. And we still keep gender equal spirit at MA in the future. And if the investment phase in 2024 happens, we can invest directly in the mushroom and the other material ingredients uh, farm in the organic plant in Vietnam also so that we can create more jobs for the local people and also reduce our price and control the whole quality materials of the supply chains for us. So our marketing strategy uh, and the media campaign will help our customer and consumer and the community to understand more about the sustainable impact on the environment, people, society, and supply chains as well. So we plan and want to take the part in, in training course about the method to measure the impact indicators more professionally than we used to. So the more we get uh, investment or achievement in our business, the more impact we will bring to the local people, society, and the region we want. Thank you, Ms. Wan. Uh, so yeah. uh, I'll go to Ms. Buckland of Husk now so that we uh, divide the questions accordingly as well. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Buckland, the question for you is, uh, how challenging is it for a company to replicate your model? Yeah, I'd, um, I would say the key barriers to entry for, for what we do are threefold. So firstly, the, the technology. So we use pyrolysis technology um, that, that is not patented, I, I have to say, because someone else did ask me about that. Um, However, it is it is ring fenced in a way because we have a financial partner who, after the test case of our next unit of pyrolysis, is considering buying the technology company and then having it work exclusively for Husk. So we it's not very buying pyrolysis, industrial pyrolysis technology is not an easy game. Uh, there aren't many um, available. It is changing, but at the moment, it's still lead in times of six months to 12 months to get one unit up and running. Uh, there's some very low quality uh, machinery coming from, from China. There is there is a very expensive machinery coming from Europe, but there's just not much available. So ring fencing the technology is, is one, one barrier to entry that we, that we consider. Um, the other is our product formulation. So at the moment, we are, most biochar companies sell raw biochar to farmers and have a whole education piece on why they should use it. It's good for the soil, good for the planet. But what we've done is taken that raw biochar and formulated it into granulated, nutrient-rich um, products, which is which is a 
um, something that, that other biochar companies haven't done. And this is over, you know, four years of agronomy and, and R&D and trials. And I think that's also another, another area that, that protects uh, us from being copied. Um, and, the, and the third is the certification. You know, increasingly there's um, a more stringency on carbon credit certification because it's had some very bad press recently. And we're really ahead of the game in, in that sense. And we're also... In it, constantly innovating to keep ahead of the game. So we're now working on soil carbon credits, not just regular carbon credits. And I think that also helps us, um, you know, stay stay ahead. But having said that, I welcome competition because there is a third of the planet soils to degrade. And the more competition that we have, the more biochar producers, the better. Really, there's a lot of room for improvement out there. Uh, maybe just one last question before we close the Q&A from you. Uh, I know that you're currently working very actively with a lot of community workers in Cambodia. What are your growth plans beyond Cambodia? Are you looking to go into the African region or are you mainly focused on Asia only? Yeah, so so the next the next installation will be in Southeast Asia. So uh, we're looking at Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Philippines, Indonesia, one of these countries. Um, within the next three years. And then the second region we'd like to work in is uh, the Mediterranean because we have our office base in, in Spain, but also because it's very highly degraded. So we're looking at North Africa and, and the Mediterranean region. So we are looking at Egypt, Turkey. Um, so we haven't yet at the moment, we have a lot of interest from Southern African countries, but we don't yet have plans to, to go there. The third region would be Latin America, because again, huge rise in organic fertilizer growth um, and and a lot of um, a lot of interest. So that that's the that's the scaling plan for now. Thank you, uh, thank you all uh, for the great presentations today. Sorry, uh, Miss Munyanza, you have a question. Sorry, go ahead. No, it's it just to complete uh, about the Rwanda and Burundi, um, the, the Burundi and DRC. In fact, in Burundi, we have already a partner. We have already a staff there. So we are really uh, looking to extend this year. And next year will be DRC. So we put that in, uh, how to call that, progressive uh, installation. And uh, next week, I will even be in Burundi to, to see how we can go further and quicker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we look forward to working with you all as you grow from continent to continent uh, and help you in your journey, in your both capital raising and your impactful journey. Um, so over to you, Priya, uh, to take it over. Thank you all for the nice presentations. Thanks so much, Jonathan, and the rest of the speakers as well. If any of you are keen on connecting with the enterprises from today, please indicate your interest in the following poll. A huge thank you to all of our speakers for contributing their knowledge and expertise. It was truly inspiring to learn from you about your businesses, as well as to get an inside look into the amazing growth plans you have in store. We'd also like to thank all of you who participated in our Q&A session. It's always great to see such a high level of engagement. To quickly recap, let me share once again what the enterprises are looking for today. Munyax Echo is looking for an additional 2.7 million US dollars in equity and debt. MA is looking for USD 2 million in convertible notes and equity. Last but not least, Husk is looking to raise the remaining USD 100k to complete their seed round. The round is closing shortly, so don't miss your chance to get in. Term sheets will be available for all three enterprises after the webinar. If you're interested in connecting with them directly, please feel free to let the Impact Partners team know by email. Last but not least, our community is growing and we invite you to expand your network, expand your impact investing portfolio with us and increase your investments impact. The links in the chat will take you to the Impact Partners 3.0 platform to sign up for an account, view our live deals and connect directly with Impact Enterprises. Thank you once again to our speakers and to all of you who joined us today. The recording will be available after the event. We hope you enjoyed the session as much as we have. Thank you everyone and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.